hearts to you and see you later. The problems, the problems we face are vast, and the means for their solution must be of corresponding magnitude. Our progress in solving them so far has been but small. The region of the unknown is infinitely greater than the known, and there is no fear of their not being work for the world's scientists and engineers for centuries to come. As to the practical applications which await us, the telephone, television, and the computer are but child's play to what the world will see in the future. I'm Bowen Dees, and it is my delightful duty to welcome you to this joint convocation. I do so most heartily. The words I've just read you, with a few small changes, were first spoken in another Franklin Institute building 100 years ago. They are those of a distinguished Johns Hopkins professor, Dr. Henry Rowland, who was then serving as president of the National Conference of Electricians. Those words were spoken on September 8th, 1884, as he opened that conference an officially sanctioned international meeting authorized by congressional action but held here in Philadelphia at the International Electrical Exhibition Building which the Franklin Institute built especially for the exhibition. One of the American participants was Nathaniel Keith, secretary of a newly formed professional society. On the last day of the conference, he pointed out that, and I again read from the proceedings of that conference, early last spring, this exhibition being contemplated and it being desired that the electricians should assemble themselves together in an organized body, some gentlemen in New York issued circulars to various electricians and professional men throughout the country with the stated object of forming a society. Such a society was formed last May and will meet here in Philadelphia on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of October. It is called the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Thus, the Franklin Institute played a role as a catalyst in the establishment of what has become IEEE as it did also, by the way, for several other organizations. I could spend much time telling you of the Franklin Institute's various contributions to the regions and the country's progress. It was no accident that the Institute received the first federal grant for research, or that its journal was for many years the journal of choice for scientists and engineers working in many fields. Its exhibitions, initiated in 1824, were of great importance to the industrial development of the young nation. The electrical exhibition was only one of some 20 such exhibitions the Institute mounted in the 19th century. To our IEEE friends, I say, your being here in the building which houses the National Memorial to Benjamin Franklin is most appropriate, for Franklin could be considered IEEE's patron saint as well as the Franklin Institutes. Caltech's Robert Millikan, speaking in this hall nearly 50 years ago, argued that Dr. Franklin belonged in the select group of 14 most 
influential scientists who had lived since Copernicus and up to the beginning of this century. In justification of his giving Franklin such a high place, he said, in part, Franklin, without any previous training whatever in either the technique or the history of physics, within two years of the time of his first experiment, had acquired a keener insight into the fundamental nature of electrical phenomena, not merely than anyone had acquired up to his time, but even than any of his successors acquired for the next 150 years, when, about 1900, the scientific world returned essentially to Franklin's views. I end as I began by quoting Professor Rowland. After remarking on the contributions basic research can make, he adds, the engineer seeks to increase the power of our bodies. It is the engineer that increases the wealth of the world and thus allows those so disposed to cultivate their tastes and to elevate themselves above the savages. The progress of the world depends upon his inventions. I look forward, as this convocation continues, to hearing of some of the possibilities foreseen by Professor Rowland as IEEE's second century begins. It is now my privilege to bring to this rostrum the president of IEEE, who certainly needs no introduction to this group, Dr. Richard Gowan. Thank you, Mr. Dees, President Null, distinguished dignitaries, and convocation participants, members of the Franklin Institute, IEEE President-elect Bill Eldon, past presidents of the Institute, vice presidents, directors, and members of the IEEE. Ladies and gentlemen, we are convened today to commemorate the very special role the Franklin Institute has had in the founding of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. As has recently been mentioned, a hundred years ago, the leaders of the newly formed American Institute of Electrical Engineers, the AIEE, traveled to Philadelphia to a site less than a half a mile from where we sit today to hold their first technical meeting. The occasion was the closing week of the International Electrical Exhibition sponsored by the Franklin Institute. This important exhibition attracted visitors from not only throughout America, but from aboard as, abroad as well. They came to witness the marvels of electricity. During the planning of the exhibition, the United States government agreed to sponsor a convocation of scientists and electricians to address the important issues of that day. Additionally, the American Association for the Advancement of Science chose to hold its annual meeting for the year 1884 at the exhibition. There were numerous exhibits and demonstrations on the use of electricity. The value of the telegraph to the world of business was emphasized. The marvels of electricity and the equipment for generating electric current and the equipment for electrifying America was prominently featured throughout the exhibition. The telephone was demonstrated, but the full recognition of its value to our future was yet to come. And in a corner of the exhibition hall, a table contained the unusual lamp constructed by Edison that had an extra plate in it. This plate, while not connected to the filament, demonstrated that current could flow from the filament. It was the harbinger of the future of the electronics that brings us together today. It was against this background of activity that the inventors, the electricians, the manufacturers, the scientists of America decided to form an American organization to represent the newly emerging profession of electrical engineering. The founders of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers felt the need for a new organization to be present at the Franklin Institute exhibition. In addition to those who would be present from the government sponsorship 
and those from the AAAS. With the cooperation of the leaders of the Franklin Institute, this new American Institute of Electrical Engineers convened its first technical convocation in Philadelphia as part of the international exhibition on October 7th and 8th, 1884. The technical papers presented addressed the problems of that day, the problems of transmitting power underneath the streets of our cities, the problems of generating electricity in an efficient manner, and of course, the new discovery, the Edison effect. This first technical meeting was an outstanding success, and the leaders of the AIEE chose to continue their new organization. Joined together with the IRE in 1963, the IEEE has continued the proud heritage of open technical discussion and the sharing of the base of technical knowledge that is so vital to the development of electrotechnology. There are now 250,000 members of the IEEE, living in 128 countries, served by 251 sections, we publish over 120,000 technical pages a year, and we hold over 250 technical meetings, and I am pleased to say have over 500 student branches. The IEEE is recognized worldwide as the foremost organization in the field of the science and engineering of electrotechnology. Therefore, it is especially appropriate that we commemorate the first technical meeting of the Institute by the dedication of a commemorative plaque to be located in the Franklin Institute. May I ask Bill if you would please uh, unveil the plaque. If you'll permit me, I would like to read the citation that will be on the plaque that will reside in the Franklin Institute. The plaque you see here is the plaque that will reside in New York City at the United Engineering Center. The plaque for the Franklin Institute reads, A Century of Electrical Progress. The International Electrical Exhibition held at the Franklin Institute, September 2 to October 11, 1884, prompted the founding of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. On May 13th of that year, and was the site of the first AIEE technical meeting on October 7th to 8th, 1884. A century later, on October 8th to 9th, 1984, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, formed through the merger of the AIEE and the Institute of Radio Engineers, again joined with the Franklin Institute to hold the IEEE Franklin Institute Centennial Technical Convocation. On this historic occasion, as the second century begins, the IEEE pays tribute to the Franklin Institute and the pioneers of both organizations whose vision launched a century of electrical progress, presented by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. President now, may I be so kind as to ask you, sir, to join me at the plaque so we may commemorate this plaque to the Franklin Institute, yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nathan Sir, we can remember. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gowan. I have asked Nat Cohn to join me here because Nat has been a past president, past chairman of the Franklin Institute, and he's a member of the Centennial Task Force of the IEEE. He has formed the bridge between us and you, and more than that, he has been a tireless worker for the success of this convocation. And together we accept this plaque uh, with a great feeling of pride in the role that the Franklin Institute <coughs> has played in the long history of your fine organization. We will display this with pride. Thank you. Right.
Yes, indeed. I have the permission of the speakers this afternoon to make sure that we have as much time as possible for the, their presentations, to refer you to the program notes for their biodata. I therefore am not going to spend precious time in going through the very lengthy materials that have been provided me with respect to each of these speakers. I'll simply say they are all most distinguished. They are the first of a very distinguished group of speakers for this entire convocation. I think we all know that the chairman of the program committee, Dr. Ed David, did a magnificent job in pulling together this set of speakers. With that said, therefore, I simply now will introduce to you, as our first speaker, Dr. Bill Hittinger of RCA. Dr. Hittinger. Thank you very much, Dr. Dees, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to join you today in this very auspicious event and to have the particular honor to address this convocation on the occasion of the centennial of this great institute. I must say, however, that the occasion is a daunting one. Uh, given the number of distinguished people present here today, it seems to me I should be out in front listening rather than speaking, but I suspect our chairman wouldn't take that too kindly at this late hour. What well, is, as we've heard, a hundred years to the day that what constitutes the IEEE today held its first meeting. Out of curiosity, I had someone look up the headlines that appeared on the front pages of the New York Times this same day in 1884. Here's a very abbreviated list. The lead story reported on proposed financial reforms in Egypt. Another reported that the city of New York had to pay a million and a half dollars for unused water meters. Probably nothing new in these stories. However, we have such stories as Lord Lytton's love letters, eloping with a Boston drummer, killed by a pumpkin, and my favorite for the day's news on October 8, 1884, How New Jersey Snakes Get Milk. <laughs> The Institute's first meeting did not make the front pages of the Times. And in many respects, this Institute is a latecomer to the field of technology. We've been preceded by many years of uh, such professions as mechanical engineering, work done by the Romans, uh, civil engineering, metallurgy, chemistry, and military engineering. But I think we've come along in a rapid fashion after that late start. The century has seen the taming of the electron and the birth of the age of information. Alvin Toffler, who I understand is here today, calls this new age the third wave. Throughout the history of the Institute, the emphasis, quite rightly, was on science and engineering and the exchange of knowledge, ideas, and concepts. The focus was on the technical. As scientists and engineers, we tend to leave the political arena to others. Some of us may even regard the art of politics as lacking the objectivity and knowledge of science. As we look to the next century and the challenges that we will face, we must examine the notion that public policy issues have scientific and engineering implications more than ever before. If this is so, it means that we as scientists and as engineers must take a greater role in how these ideas are resolved. This is not a new concept, of course. The precedent for such a major change in the direction of this institute goes back to the days of the Republic's founding fathers, who often combined their interests in science and politics. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson are two examples that come to mind. Politics and science are, to borrow C.P. Snow's phrase, two cultures that are more often than not considered separate entities unto themselves. In fact, science and policies, and politics rather, are truly inseparable. It is just that those who practice science and politics tend to see themselves as citizens of different cultures. 
There are many examples throughout history, but one, although obscure, illustrates my point. In the 19th century, there was an economist and political scientist, Henry Charles Carey, who is credited with introducing the experimental method into the social sciences. Karl Marx called Carey, who incidentally was a Philadelphian, the only American economist of note. I don't know whether that's a plus or a minus. Prior to the Civil War, Carey wrote to Lincoln calling for the industrialization of the South. Once industrialized, Carey believed, the South would no longer depend on selling its cotton on the English market or on buying English manufactured goods. In his view, the ensuing prosperity would bring increased economic benefits to both planter and slave and soon lead to emancipation. Carey pressed Lincoln to build a great highway across the South, linking it to the North and thereby establishing closer economic relations between the two regions. From the perspective of hindsight, which is always, of course, 2020, it's easy to see how different our history might have been if Carey's advice had been taken. Of course, this does not mean that Lincoln was wrong. His concern was preservation of the Union and the rights of man, political issues. Carey's vision bridged the scientific and the political. It is this vision that is needed today. We are already in the midst of the age of information and cresting on Mr. Toffler's third wave. This new age brings with it new opportunities for human progress, but it also poses formidable political challenges. It has been said that up to the Middle Ages, power attracted money. From the Renaissance on, money attracted power. I believe in this new age, information, information will attract power. How this power will be used is a political concern and a proper issue for public policy debate. It also seems to me that as scientists and engineers, we are at the leading edge of this new age and therefore should have more than a passing interest in how the instruments we create are to be used. Daniel Yankelevich, the public opinion researcher, writing in the fall issue of Science and Technology notes as follows, quote, science in its institutional forms, the professional associations, faculties and, ac and academies can also join the debate as social political entities concerned with the health of the larger society. There are a handful of pressure points where the disparity between scientific accomplishment and social arrangements are most acute. As a second strategy, official science may wish to gain a better understanding of these pressure points and help to formulate action to relieve them even though they involve knowledge that transcends scientific competence in the narrow sense." End of quote. The pressure points in the new age of information that impact our areas of concern involve education, industry, and government. In education, a central question, it seems to me, is how to provide literacy in the age of information. We already have seen the slide rule replaced by the personal computer. Our children and grandchildren are beginning to use computers in grammar school. At the university level, the concern is with course content, not only in engineering, but also how to organize arts, science, and engineering in a university structure. Then there is the challenge of providing self-renewal and training for older individuals. Continuing the growth of service industries will accelerate as we move to the information society. As a consequence of mechanization, there is reduced labor content per unit of production in many fields, certainly manufacturing, agriculture, transportation, and commerce. This will continue. At the same time, newer industrial societies, particularly in the Pacific Basin, are becoming more competitive. Manufacturing certainly will not disappear from the U.S. scene, but we will be more hard-pressed than ever with worldwide competition. Another aspect of this change is the concern that we legitimately have over our balance of trade. One wonders what we will trade as we move more and more toward information rather than hardware. An interesting problem, I think, for, for all of us and our government in particular to be concerned about. The age of information will create new products and services and will continue to grow. Its new business opportunities and its risk of failure will be greater than ever before. How do we deal with these new issues and the pressure points that they create? It seems to me that their scope is beyond the capability of any one organization or segment of our society. 
There is a definite need for combining various elements in government, industry, and academia to leverage their talents and resources in shaping public policy on these issues. The agenda for such a consortia might include such subjects as supporting basic research, devising ways to improve the investment climate, sorting out the fair trade issue, and addressing the issue for the need for a national industrial policy. Let me take a few of these issues and outline how I view them. In basic research, we have to stress that basic commercial research is just as important to the national interest as basic defense research. As you know, half of all basic research in this country is defense-related. Industry has not, and probably cannot, devote the necessary investment to basic research because the payoffs are too remote and highly risky. There are some exceptions to this, of course, the Bell Labs model being one known to all of us. The continued role of our economy in terms of employment and income may well depend on the advances created in our great industrial and university laboratories. R&D is the seed corn of our economy, and this is essentially true in the age of information. Within this context, the subject of a national industrial policy is currently a very hot issue. I suppose we can consider an industrial policy comparable to the industrial policy of Japan or of France. Following those examples, we could set up, a certain national, set up certain national goals, certain national energy goals, certain national housing goals, certain national trading goals, by example. More and more talk is coming out of rather unexpected quarters about this kind of thing. Lee Iacocca, for example, has talked and written articles about a national industrial policy. Felix Rohayton has written some brilliant articles about it. Henry Ford has talked about cooperation between government and industry in the style of the Japanese or perhaps the French. Now this is an argument that could go on forever, and I know each of you has a different view of it. My point of view is that a national industrial policy probably could not come to pass in the U.S. even if it were desirable. The conditions of the past and our concept of the marketplace are too deeply ingrained. I don't think these perceptions could change in time to help us recreate industry and thereby recreate wealth in the U.S. Given the complexities of these issues, what should the role of IEEE be as it moves into its second century? I believe that the Institute should continue its role both as a source of education for all its members and to the nation in addressing technical issues. I also believe that the resources of the Institute could be used as a major technical forum in effect to become a MEDI of the United States. MEDI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry in Japan, by itself is probably not the sole reason, perhaps not even a major reason, for Japan's economic success. MEDI's forte seems to be its ability to bring divergent points of view together in creating national policies that are generally accepted in its society. Its effectiveness is not measured by the size of its budget, but by the web of communications and the close coordination it has established with the private sector. This coordination and communication tends to set priorities and to focus resources. What is done in this country in an individualistic, haphazard way is done in a rational, systematic way in theirs. I believe that the IEEE should examine media as a model and to evaluate it as an instrument that could make significant economic and technological contributions to the nation. I know that the course of action I suggest is a difficult one fraught with controversy. It represents a major course change in the traditional role for an institute with a century of heritage behind it. Yet if we are to embark on a second century, a century that will undoubtedly see unprecedented technological and social change. My suggestion is offered primarily to stimulate debate and dialogue in the formal and informal sessions of this convocation and others to follow. We have some of the greatest scientific and engineering minds in this country here today, and I look forward perhaps to some stimulating discussions on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hittinger. I'd now like to ask Drs. Frosch and Fletcher to come up and occupy seats at this table. We're going to have 
the following format this afternoon. Dr. Frosch will speak. Dr. Fletcher will discuss his presentation. Then we will have some questions from the floor. Immediately after that, we're going to have a coffee break. Following that, we will have two additional presentations, discussions, questions from the floor. And if all goes well, according to the schedule that we have attempted to outline, we'll be finished at five so that there will be plenty of time for you to prepare yourselves for the splendid affairs of the evening. Again, following the outline I gave a few minutes ago, I simply present to you Dr. Robert Frosch of General Motors. Dr. Frosch. Thank you very much. The title of this session is Changing the System, the Impact of Electrical and Electronics Technologies on Human Endeavor in the Second Century. And I am to speak on space. I remind you first that a hundred years is a very long time. And second, that predicting the future has a very poor history. No one that I know of has succeeded in doing it by statistics or by numerical manipulation or by examination of trends. And indeed, it is not, it is not surprising because it appears in hindsight that the future depends on what I can only describe as very tiny giant steps, which are not recognized for what they are at the time frequently, but later have an important growth and an important history. What one can do, and perhaps it is just as chancy, but I think it is more interesting, is to discuss the creation of the future. What are the things that it would be interesting and useful to try to do, given the tools that we have in our hands now and the way in which they are developing? And I would like to outline at least one such possible course. One can only, of course, set a course and be prepared to adjust it and look at the tools and possibilities that are thereby conjured up. This is an exercise of the imagination, but it has to be confined in certain ways, and it is always a personal view. The confining of the exercise of imagination I can best describe by quoting Arthur Clarke and then turning his quotation around. Arthur Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I caution you to note that it is not thereby the case that any magic is indistinguishable from a sufficiently advanced technology. And I note the caution in the words of Francis Bacon, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. We will have to live within the framework of whatever the rules of the universe turn out to be as we learn them in the course of the next hundred years. But keeping that in mind, I would like to describe a line of possible future. I start from what I will take at least as my own hypothesis for a direction to be gone into in space. I take it because I think it is the right one, obviously. I take it also in this hall because I think it is one that Benjamin Franklin would at least have been extremely sympathetic with, if not a leader in. And I take it because I think we are facing some problems in the human future on the planet that makes some alternatives at least interesting, if not important. 
The end desire I take to be for the next 50 to 100 years, and I caution you that the history of space thus far has had the accomplishments always occur before the time at which they were predicted, is to explore and use the solar system. Now we have been talking about exploring it and to some degree actually exploring it throughout the history of NASA and the space program. And occasionally we have talked about using it. I will leave the question of the rest of the universe for later in my talk. In fact, when I say understand and explore and use, I mean literally in the sense of using energy and material elsewhere, as well as understanding what is there. Now, why should we want to do that? Well, I think in the first place, because it is a continuation of something we have been doing as a species for, I suppose, 50 or 100,000 years, namely exploring, looking, and using. Secondly, I would assert that some of the problems that we're facing as a species on the planet suggest that we may, in fact, succeed in making it a difficult place in which to live. And I am not particularly suggesting the nuclear war question, but rather just the problems that are becoming a pressure on the use of the biosphere and the support of our own systems by our own numbers and existence and the way we use it. And I guess I have become, starting as a scientist, sufficient of an engineer so that I always like a hedge position in my technology. I think it would be nice for this species to have another place as well as the one which it is engaged in changing now. And it seems clear that the rest of the solar system is another place. Unfortunately, it is another place in which it is not either simple nor natural for us to live, but perhaps that can be fixed. At the moment, it is extraordinarily expensive and difficult to do nearly anything off this planet. In fact, the problem is that the expense is such that we are looking very hard for ways to find things which, whose value commercially justifies that expense. And we have found a few, global communications being one, and some particular uses of low gravity being others that are developing at the present time. But the question is, how could we make it economical and economically sustainable to be elsewhere than on this planet? What we're looking for is some form of self-sustaining economic system upon which we can base our exploration, our development, and our use of the rest of the matter and energy in the solar system. Well, that too has precedence in the history of human exploration. It's called living off the land. That is, you don't go to the new continent or the far west carrying with you everything you will need to sustain yourself. You propose to go in some way carrying the tools that will enable you to do most of the things you need when you get there. But of course, there are certain things that you expect to continue to import from the home country. Well, how can one go about doing this? I guess it is my assertion, and I borrow the idea from many colleagues, that we are in fact embarked on the technological directions that will in fact bring us quite automatically to the technological possibilities for doing so. We have begun to construct out of the technological materials 
of computers, communications, electric motors, network thinking, system ideas, software, and the whole litany of things that make the electro-technological revolution, we have begun to construct systems that are more and more self-sustaining. Ten years ago, I think this was a laboratory discussion. Today, it is a factory reality, and while much of it is still an aspiration for factories, it is an aspiration which is rapidly being constructed. And that is to say, the productive unit, let's not argue about whether it's a whole factory or a part of a factory, which is in fact a self-operating unit on a fairly large scale. We're certainly building and talking about self-operating manufacturing cells, certainly those that take in partly finished parts and end up with assembled units, and many that take in raw materials and end up with partially finished parts. It is not a very tremendous step to doing mining on the same kind of basis. It seems curious that people need to be in the mines to operate the machines when the presence of the people really changes the nature of the mines in some ways that's rather inconvenient when we can perfectly well do most of that without most of the people in the mines, but we'd still need the people to run the machines from elsewhere. We can certainly do the chemical beneficiation and the chemical separations and the creation of the material mostly without people. So the assertion is that one can, in the course of time, put this together into what amounts to a self-replicating machine which starts with raw materials and solar energy and is a factory which ends up with the capability to construct another factory next to itself just like the first one. Now, there are lots of questions of the convergence of this process and lots of questions as to whether one can do everything that is required in it. For purposes of economics, however, and for the purpose of exploration and use, it is really not necessary to have a completely convergent self-replicating system. In fact, we probably wouldn't trust it if we did, as the history of nearly indust any industrial process and all of the historical events in the space program have tended to suggest there are moments, which I will call epsilon, when you really need somebody to kick the wheels or unstick the hinge or rethink the software that was thought about five years ago and looked perfectly adequate but isn't quite right now, and so on. So that perhaps we can only get to self-replication less epsilon, and the epsilon is extremely important because we need the people there to make sure about the epsilon. And I guess epsilon can be described as the piece which is the difference between it works and it almost works. I would call this the robotics route to a self generating economic system. The energy is available, the materials are available, although some of them are a little bit loose and not as available as one would like. I think we are developing the technology and such a thing gets to be extremely interesting. Why is it economically interesting? I think it is economically interesting in the following definition that if one constructed a first machine or two of this kind and simply set them out in a suitable place, after a while there are four machines and then there are eight machines and you all know the biological, the biological meaning of an exponential and this is an exponential. 
I remark that it does not violate the first and second laws of thermodynamics. We're using a very hot heat source called the sun. There's plenty of material, and we're rejecting to a very cold heat sink called the rest of the universe. This all seems a perfectly reasonable technological direction, and one which would make it possible, except perhaps for the epsilon, to build an industrial capability off the planet using a single export of machines in order to do it. I think we would send some people with the machines both because we want to be there and because of Epsilon. Now, there may be lots of things which, like the pioneers going west, we do not care to try to manufacture in situ. It would be easy enough to import and export them. Uh, for example, in the current technology, I rather suspect we might want to export the chips from the ground, at least for a while. What would we pay for them in? Well, that is an economic question and not a technological question. Gold, if anybody wants it. Uranium, if anybody wants it. Or energy, if anybody wants it, and not necessarily radiant energy. Energy can be shipped in solid and liquid form and beneficiated minerals can be considered as either materials or energy, depending on why, how you choose to use them. From an investment point of view, it's a very large investment, but the ultimate gain is presumably infinite. There is a wear-out time, but the ordinary terms of depreciation and amortization, it seems to me, do not apply for this situation. What would such a program look like? Well, my assertion is that the central core of the technological program, that is, the self-replicating machine, is simply a continuation of the industrial program on which many corporations are already embarked. I know of nobody who has embarked on the whole program but everybody I know seems to be embarked on a piece of the program. And so, in the end, it seems possible that that technology will develop in the normal course of events out of our current developments in electrotechnology, materials, and mechanics. What we don't understand nearly so well are the details of how to operate under the various conditions that will be required between here and the manufacturing site and at the manufacturing site, wherever it is that we choose. Nor do we really understand the industrial conditions when vacuum is free, but materials mostly don't come very neatly concentrated, and we don't really know the value of certain things to be done without gravity because we have that capability available to us as well. So we need some starting points in which to learn how to begin to use such a technology. And that's really what the significance of the space station kind of direction is for me. It is likely that there will be some commercial enterprises that will be important in a space station. And it is certain that we will do a good deal of science from it, as well as a great deal of scientific exploration quite independent of it. But perhaps most important is the fact that it will be a place in which we can tinker with things. I think the history of science and technology demonstrates that one of the most important possessions of the technical professions is a place and an opportunity to tinker under the circumstances that are interesting. After all, low temperature physics was not invented out of whole cloth and all of the experiments conjured up without anybody having available a low temperature laboratory in which to try things. Nor has this been true of electricity or anything else. If you want to find out what it is interesting to do in zero G, then you had better go there and make a few mistakes of the kind that will enable you to discover some things that you hadn't found 
otherwise. So I think that is a first step. The technological directions are being fixed, in any case, by other interests of ours. And the question is, what is the right mix of people, machines, and aspiration to begin to consider carrying out such a program? Now, I would argue that if it becomes possible, as indeed I have suggested, to be economically viable and perhaps nearly independent of the Earth, in an industrial operation elsewhere, on the moon or an asteroid or Mars, then a number of questions of the relationship of the new places and the old place arise. And these are economic and will certainly be political. I described the new place, wherever it is, as being a hedge against some problems in the old place. It cannot be that unless it becomes a living place. And it cannot be that unless we solve the biological problems that go with some places that are now sterile as compared to where we live now. So that implies in the long run some program of technology which we now do not understand, except in the vaguest outlines, that deal with the construction of ecological situations in circumstances where there cannot now be said to be any ecology at all, but only the possibility of totally artificial arrangements. So that too, I think, has to go into the program and while we are beginning to see the outlines of what a large-scale biotechnology would look like, surely the relationship of those outlines to our current electrotechnology are scarcely clear at all. Although it is certainly the case that those technologies involve communication, sensing, control, and computing, so that surrounding the biology there is increasingly an atmosphere of electronics, electricity, and computing. I said that I would come back towards the end of my talk to the rest of the universe, and that of course is where the great difficulties really arise as we see the physics at the present time. That is, there is nothing all that mysterious about going out and doing something in the solar system. The times to get there and the energies and the expenditures are commensurate with what we know and understand. But the rest of the universe has times and difficulties that are not commensurate with what we understand. But on a hundredth anniversary, it is worth at least making the following comment. A hundred years ago, we did not even know that the velocity of light was a natural speed limit for velocity in the universe. So we had no idea at that point that there was any time and, and, and speed barrier to doing what we wanted. I have no idea, none of us do, whether there is any way around that problem, but it is certainly clear that the universe is being seen to consist of some very curious physical objects, and whether that will in the next hundred years change our ideas about how to move around in it and what we can do is not clear. But if I may, I would like to conclude again by quoting Francis Bacon, whose comment I leave you to interpret, but I think it makes the point. They are poor sailors who do not believe in the land when all they can see is the sea. Thank you.
That's a pretty hard act to follow, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, the alter ego to uh, Dr. Bob Frosch, having preceded him at uh, NASA and being a consultant to him after he succeeded me. Um, talking about the space program, I have to go back to 1958 and uh, remind you of a question that was asked a very distinguished government official whom we all know. Uh, what are your plans for the space program? And the answer came back. Uh, it seemed humorous at the time, but it seems very apropos now. The space is a place, not a program. And I think uh, as time goes on, we're becoming more and more aware of, uh, of that. And Dr. Frosch has talked about uh, big space like the universe and small space like where um, uh, resources might be. But uh, let, let me remind you all that space begins somewhere between 20 and 100 miles up, and they're still arguing about that in the United Nations. Uh, it must be uh, uh, lower than 100 because we have space things going around at 100 miles up, and it must be above 20 because we have airplanes and balloons at least uh, uh, flying at 20 miles up. So somewhere in between there is space. Uh, on the other hand, the other end of space must be at least, uh, what would you say, 15 billion light years away, something of that sort. And so we really uh, have to focus first at uh, what we might call near, uh, near Earth space, and that's what I'll try to uh, talk a little bit about, the near Earth space being the bottom, the lowest altitude, whatever we want to define it as, and let's say, uh, the moon, or at least the moon and the so-called Apollo asteroids, which are the nearby uh, sources of materials. Uh, I, I've left out Mars, and maybe that's wrong. But nevertheless, uh, in the near term, if we want materials to be collected and mined and used uh, in the self-replicating system by Dr. Frush, we look, have to look at the so-called Apollo asteroids, and I don't need to remind you what they are. They're in the same orbit as Earth and they come very close to the Earth periodically. The only ones we can see are about two kilometers across. Uh, the moon you all know about, presumably. Uh, that's where our resources might be. I, I guess we could collect uh, solar dust and things of that sort, but I, uh, Bob, I, I think you'd agree with me that that's not the best place to start. You'd start on the moon or in the asteroids. And so basically, uh, looking at that region and thinking about it a little bit, uh, 20 miles up uh, embraces uh, within 20 miles of every country in the world, uh, not too different from the problem of our oceans. And uh, oceans have been uh, investigated over the millennia and have been used for both commerce and warfare. Uh, if, if you like, you can extend the, the analogy a little bit further and say it's not unlike uh, air. Uh, in the early days of aeronautics, uh, the Wright brothers' um, uh, experiment was, was kind of a gimmick for them, although they had uh, some vision of the future. But nevertheless, it was, a, it was an experiment for them. Let's see if we can't sustain uh, flight for a period of time um, without any help from the ground. And for 15 years after the Wright brothers' experiment, uh, the U.S. did very little else but uh, stunts, circuses, uh, if, you, if you like, uh, no, no really tour de forces. Uh, but with World War I, it became quite clear that aircraft were being Euro uh, used by the Europeans for observation of all things. You may not remember that. That's before your time. Um, my father remembers it very well, and uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Kobayashi, who is a friend of my father's, might remember those days. But uh, nevertheless, they did occur, and we in the U.S., found ourselves behind, and you all know the story of NACA, how it was created. It was created primarily because we saw ourselves falling behind the Europeans in the, uh, in the aeronautics business. Well, space is not all that different. Uh, we started with a, uh, an anxiety because of Sputnik, and uh, we, we established, however, in reaction to that anxiety, anxiety a, uh, and NASA, which was created out of NACA, but more importantly, perhaps, 
It was created uh, partially by combining some elements of the rocket program, which uh, really came from Germany. Uh, it came from Germany by way of uh, US and Russia, but we won't go into that. Uh, um, by the way, Hermann Oberth, who was von Braun's teacher and wrote many of the early uh, books on space travel, uh, is still alive and they're celebrating his uh, anniversary, I believe, uh, this month, I'm not sure. I think it, it's either this month or next month in Germany. At any rate, uh, uh, let, me, let me go ahead with that analogy between uh, air and space. It started out as a military uh, idea, both uh, on the oceans and in the air, and pretty soon, like decades, uh, it became, uh, at least both air and sea, a viable commercial enterprise. And that's about where we are now. It's true that we have TV satellites or communications satellites, uh, very successful. That was an obvious extension of something we already knew about. We did not have good ways of getting television overseas, and so it started with television and then it gradually moved to telep telepathy and became, instead of overseas, domestic as well. And now we have television program coming out of our ears, but that's a whole other story. Uh, it is not so obvious what has been happening in Earth observations, but the same kinds of things happen there, but primarily government supported. And uh, we, we have the weather satellites, which are now taken for granted. We also have Landsats and the beginnings of ocean sats. These are primarily experimental devices. And on you can go, uh, and we don't know where uh, commercial enterprises will end, but I'm sure that within three decades, we will be mining the moon or the asteroids, whichever it turns out to be easiest. We have been to the moon, we haven't been visiting asteroids, and I, I think the two obvious uses of uh, material there would be A, uh, to build other uh, stations. Uh, Bob calls it self-replicating stations. I will call them lunar colonies a la uh, Jerry O'Neill at Princeton. Uh, there certainly will be L5 colonies or something similar to that or bases on the moon for either scientific or self-replicating purposes. Uh, it's not so obvious that you can do this with Apollo asteroids. But this will go naturally, some of its spin-offs from uh, uh, the space program sponsored by NASA, some of its spin-offs from the military space program. I would like to just touch on one other aspect of the program, which I don't believe uh, is uh, in any way trying to downgrade this uh, projection of the future, but over the uh, millennia, we did have to protect uh, our treaties on the sea, and we did have to protect navigation and our various commercial enterprises from those adventurers who wish to interfere with these enterprises, pirates or whatever, or hostile uh, countries, uh, by patrolling the seas. And the people that patrol the seas quite often control the commerce. And that is what we are now facing uh, in, in terms of the uh, new, newly coined phrase, space warfare. <laughs> it's a popular word with politicians nowadays, but those of us that have been involved in the uh, business know that space warfare really started in 1944 with the V-2s when rockets with ordinary uh, chemical warheads on were launched from uh, Germany to the UK. Uh, and these V-2s had to travel through space. Um, you may not remember, although those of you that are involved uh, do, that the first uh, space program started uh, very soon thereafter, 1946, in this country when it was uh, observed that if you wanted to get higher than airplanes and look at what the other fellow's doing, you needed a observation satellite. And so it, uh, it, I guess it was Douglas Aircraft, it became RAND Corporation. The first uh, observation satellite uh, was born. Uh, and we, as you know, use these for verification of the various treaties that we uh, have made vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the Russians and other countries. And uh, so really, the space program was born, the space program in NASA or any place else was born out of these two enterprises, both of which were warfare, uh, the, the V-2 uh, and the uh, observation satellites. Uh, in 1954, uh, the Von Neumann Committee uh, observed properly that what we thought was a gimmick 
namely V2s that could travel across the ocean, uh, became a reality because it became quite clear that nuclear warheads, namely hydrogen bombs, if you, want, if you like, were possible in a very small size. And therefore, it became possible for one country to more or less annihilate the other using nuclear warheads on the so-called ICBMs. I happen to be involved in that program, and I hope I'm not involved in another one, because that is space warfare of the worst kind. But nevertheless, ICBMs do have to travel uh, up above the space limit, typically 400 miles if it's an ICBM, 6,000 miles range, lower if it's an SLBM, or still lower if it's an IRBM or a tactical ballistic, miss ballistic missile. It's inconceivable to me that we have lasted this long uh, having the capability of passing weapons through space without having some sort of a space patrol. It took some of the youngsters uh, to remind us of this. I, it was never in my mind when I was working on the ICBM program. By the way, it started with the Thor, a little one, then it went to an Atlas, a little bigger one, then a, a Titan. Those are all forgotten. We found that we had to put them underground to protect them. And that's when the Minuteman was born, and the Minuteman 1, Minuteman 2, leading up to the MX, and, and the Russians are doing the same, apparently. We all thought that was the way to protect our uh, uh, assets, but uh, it didn't occur to us, most of us, that you uh, ought to have a way of preventing these things from going from one place to the other. And just recently, you know, that is in the next last 20 years, uh, we began to think of ways of stopping these warheads from coming uh, by. Now, I should say that uh, patrolling started before that because we began to watch what the other fellow was doing. And we weren't allowed to watch by flying over his territory with airplanes. Uh, that was illegal. See, that's, that's why we get into an argument about 20 miles versus 100 miles. It's illegal to fly over the other fellow's territory, but it's not apparently illegal to pass a satellite over his territory. And as you know, we pass satellites over, there, over everybody's territory uh, several times every month. Uh, NASA has one, uh, for example, that looks from 550 miles up that goes, what was it, every, every nine days, Bob, something like that. Uh, two of them, uh, the nine to, nine to uh, depends on whether it's one or two, nine days or 18 days, looking at every part of the world every nine or 18 days. So we are beginning to patrol in the sense of watch, but then we began to worry about some of the treaties. And we used to, uh, I used to be in the arms control business, and we used to talk about verification. If we agree to do this and you agree to do that, we will watch to make sure that you do what you say you were doing with the appropriate observation satellites. Now we don't talk about verification anymore, we talk about enforcement. That's a different kind of a problem because, all right, so I noticed that you were cheating on the agreement that you made with me, what do I do about it? And we found not, not a heck of a lot. And uh, that's what leads us to think uh, that new treaties ought to have some sort of enforcement. And we, I don't mean by enforcement dropping H-bombs on the other fellow either. That's not a very good way to, to, to do it. Whatever is the case, uh, let me just uh, suggest that because space is a place and it's only uh, 20 to 100 miles from all of our countries, we really have to think about the problem of keeping space peaceful. And uh, I think all of these things that uh, uh, Bob Frosch talked about, including even going to the next star, doesn't look to, so difficult to me. All you have to have is a more efficient propulsion system and a little uh, courage to wait, uh, what would it be, four years each way at, as a minimum? That's not too bad. Uh, I think all of these things can be worked out, but we do have to make space peaceful, and we do have to patrol it, uh, and if we continue in a wise and careful way, I think uh, the space place and the space program will flourish for decades and hopefully for many centuries to come. Thank you very much. Now is the time for questions and I, on behalf of the organizing group, will ask that as you ask your question, you identify yourself. Who has a question for either of the speakers? I don't believe it. Dr. Swan. 
Dr. Schwann is the questioner this time. I read with great interest your article in Issue, in which you describe what potentially might be, what we might be able to do for a defense system. I read the article by Dr. Keyboys and the last article. Now I went through the articles force and bag to try to form an opinion. I didn't succeed at all. It was still very confusing to me. In your article, as I read it twice, you seem not to take a final stand. You just outline potential technologies, but you seem to abstain from opinion if it should be done or not. Would you care to comment on it? I'm going to say a little about the question so that all of you know what was asked. Dr. Schwann comments on having read the articles in the first issue of Issues, the new National Academy of Sciences journal, one of which was written by Dr. Fletcher, one by Dr. Keyworth, and others. The uh, question is, did Dr. Fletcher really form an opinion? Or what can he do to help Dr. Schwann form an opinion on these contrasting particles? Well, uh, that was a, an accurate observation, Dr. Swan. By the way, I, I want to make sure that my colleagues are not neglected. Uh, the other article was written by Dr. Spanowski and Drell from Stanford University. Uh, my role in that uh, issue of science and technology was to simply not take a stand, but to uh, expose uh, at least the, uh, in the open literature uh, what, what, what were the results of a study that was done a year ago uh, on whether this uh, space defense in this initiative, as it's now called, we call it defense, defensive technology study, uh, could work, could work. And the answer we came up with is yes, it could work. But uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, C.P. Snow, quoting C.P. Snow, politics and technology have to work together. And uh, this is why I said this has to be done very carefully. Uh, one just can't go ahead and uh, uh, develop a defensive system. And by the way, it can be done. There's no question about that. But it depends whether it works or not. depends on what the other fellow decides to do. And uh, I think if, if we had a peaceful relationship between the two countries, we would develop the defensive system together. If we don't have a peaceful relationship between the two countries, uh, then we have to take other steps. That means we have to take some initiative, much the same as we did. Uh, I, I'm not sorry to have to say it, uh, with, but with the, uh, the so-called H-bomb. There was a lot of controversy at that time with whether we should go ahead with such a terrible weapon. But in retrospect, we had no choice. And I think that's the position I took in that paper. Now, uh, there's others that think we have no choice but deploy the system. I think that's what has to be done very carefully. And that depends on both politics and technology. And I only discuss technology in that article. Dr. Frosch, do you have any comments no. on this question? Any other questions? Then we are going to break for 20 minutes for coffee. And I hope to see you back in here very shortly after 3. Do you know that it was, it was the... Uh,